Welcome to the quality measurement in health professional education, revisiting the metrics, our international conference, which I'm very pleased that kicks off today with the pre-conference workshops. Assessing the quality of health professional education interventions is a task that appears more difficult than the comparable task with clinical intervention. What to measure, how best we can measure it, and so what are important questions we are struggling and trying to find answer to it. The aim of this conference is to create an opportunity for health professionals, educators, regulatory bodies, healthcare authorities, public and private healthcare services providers to interact with experts in the fields of quality and assessment, share experiences, and how to introduce new assessment method in their own context. The speakers are scholars and leaders of innovations in health professional education. The conference will be an excellent opportunity to meet, discuss, and exchange opinions and best practices in the field of assessment and program evaluation. It's a, a great honor and pleasure for me to present two dear friends, Professor Trudy Roberts and Professor Richard Fuller. I'm sure many of you knows Professor Trudy, uh, who is the Professor of Medical Education at the Leeds Institute of Medical Education, University of Leeds, the former uh, president of, of AMI, contributing to the advance of medical education and health professional education, not only in UK, but all over the world. And I, Professor Fuller, Richard Fuller, Director of Education at the Cancer Research UK Manchester Institute, University of Manchester. Professor Fuller has influenced the domain or the field of assessment, student assessment and program evaluation, uh, contributing to advance of our knowledge and practice in the field of assessment. This afternoon, the, what they're going to share with all of us is how to assess professionalism, uh, a practical guide. Very difficult domain, how to measure professionalism, how to assess it in, while it is related to different contexts. So I leave you to enjoy this workshop and thank you very much, Trudy and Richard for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Can I add uh, my welcome to that of Professor Handy and how nice of him to give a, a personal welcome. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here and I congratulate him uh, on organising this really important uh, conference. I'd also like to give a shout out to two people, Dr. Walid, who uh, did the introduction there, and Mr. Siraj, who are probably the most important uh, <clears throat> people to Richard and I, because Mr. Siraj is a technical expert as well, and they've really helped us with this. So I'm just going to say a little bit about myself and then I'm going to um, uh, get Richard to tell you about himself. We were thinking of having people uh, in the audience tell us about, uh, tell about themselves, but I think we think there's probably a bit, a few more people than we thought would be here. So we're going to go into our slides. But one thing to say is that um, if you have any questions, as Dr. Walid says, please put them in the chat box um, because we don't want to wait right till the end. There may be things that you want to discuss beforehand. And when I speak, uh, Richard will be manning the chat box. And when he speaks, I'll be manning the chat box. So we'll build between us, um, uh, address everything that you wanted to know. 
during the at the middle we'll hope to have a 10 minute break so people can uh, stretch their legs or uh, go to the bathroom or whatever so first of all let me just tell you about myself i've uh, now retired on the 31st of december i retired from the university of leeds so i'm footloose and fancy free as uh, as professor fuller knows but for 15 years uh, at the university of leeds i chaired the student fitness to practice or health and conduct committee and it was during that time that i developed an interest in in professionalism and really what it means and how we can uh, help students come in as young people, uh, perhaps naive in many ways, and then develop the and um, become the doctors, that we, uh, excellent doctors that we want them to be. So Richard, just uh, over to you, just to introduce yourself. Um, uh, thanks, Trudy. Um, I'd like to point out that while, Tr while Trudy claims she's retired, she seems to be busier than ever, but um, so I'm not looking forward to retirement myself. So uh, I'm Richard Fuller. I'm a stroke physician and geriatrician uh, in clinical practice, as well as my academic work. And uh, like Trudy, uh, a huge amount of my work across undergraduate and postgraduate practice has been um, really centred around managing issues around professional behaviours. And, and a real observation for us is very much that when we see issues in relation to knowledge or competence, attendance or engagement, there are often issues of professionalism uh, underneath that. Yet it's been one of the areas of practice and assessment, as Professor Hamdi uh, quite rightly flagged, that has been so difficult for us to grapple with. Um, you know, and that particularly is important in my work with the General Medical Council, where we see doctors who may have uh, apparent performance concerns where there may be issues about well-being and professional behaviour. So it's really great to be part of this and to share thoughts and opinions. And as Trudy says, we encourage you to really shout out in the chat um, and, uh, and get involved and share opinions and thoughts and questions. So I think Trudy's going to start us off. So without further ado, we'll share some slides. Thanks, Richard. Um, so um, assessing professionalism, we do think it probably is one of the most difficult areas. Uh, as you know, medical education has really come a long way. And now I think we're reasonably uh, confident about yeah, assessing knowledge through things like single best ans answer questions and testing skills through OSCEs and workplace-based assessments. But in terms of, uh, of assessing professionalism, that's much more uh, difficult, we feel. And yet, and yet it is so very important as I'm sure you agree, and that I presume that's why you're here with us today. <clears throat> so let's just tell you what we're going to look at. Um, we're going to look at a historical perspective because I think that history is always really interesting. And if we don't uh, learn from history, then we risk making the mistakes again. I'm then going to talk about uh, importance of professionalism um, and to show you some data about why it is important, although I suspect some of you may know this already and that's why you're here. We're going to then look at the views of professionalism and we want, we're going to, we've got a couple of things where we're going to ask you to write in the chat box, your, uh, your views. And then we're going to talk to the most important thing, which Richard is going to take over, which is about how do we assess it? Really. So let me talk about the historical perspective, first of all. So um, we always think that um, uh, is anything uh, new in, in medicine? Is there something new about this? But in fact, actually, um, you know that uh, really from the fifth century uh, BC, uh, the Hippoc here is the Hippocratic Oath. And for those of you who perhaps don't speak ancient Greek or read it, here's a, here's a uh, translation of it. But within this, right from the very beginning, Hippocrates recognized the importance of, uh, uh, of professionalism. And as you can see, if you um, look at the second half of this, that actually there's a lot of mention in there of professionalism. If we come a little bit further uh, up to date, um, to the 19th century, uh, this gentleman, uh, some of you may recognise this. Richard uh, at the beginning wondered whether this was my husband, but actually it's not my husband. It's actually James Paget, uh, the famous uh, physician who uh, gave his name to uh, several diseases, Paget's disease of the nipple, Paget's disease of the bone and so forth. But what many people don't know is that he was probably the first medical educationalist and he published the uh, first paper on medical education. 
and it's here and it's entitled What Becomes of Medical Students? And it was published in the um, Bart's Hospital Reports of 1869. And this was a very interesting study. It was a long study that he did over uh, 10 years and uh, actually uh, had uh, several hundred uh, students that he actually uh, analyzed. So I'm going to show you some of the data here. Now, um, I used to think, well, um, as 41 uh, students died in pupillage, then things are not as bad these days as they have been previously. But obviously, with the, pres with the recent pandemic, uh, 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 COVID, um, then actually that's not, that's a different uh, uh, scenario that we're in. But you can see that, that there's a general spread of, uh, of uh, People, how the students did. But I'm not going to talk about the distinguished or for those who were in great success, because they're not really interesting to us, are there? There were always people in our year at university who were like that. I don't know if it was the same for you. And they were actually usually quite boring people. So I want to concentrate on those who failed entirely and those who left the profession. So he said about those who failed entirely, <coughs> excuse me, there was a, they were a very mixed class. There was nothing that joined them together other than the fact that they were not successful. He said that 15 of those students were never able to pass exams due to idleness. And I think we've probably seen that ourselves. Listlessness, I'm not quite certain what he meant by listlessness or want of intellect, that they were just not clever enough. He said six failed because of scandalous misconduct. And perhaps these are the more interesting to us. And sadly, he doesn't actually go into detail about what that scandalous misconduct was. And 10 failed due to uh, intemperance and dissipation. That is, they probably drank uh, too much and played too much uh, than they should have done uh, either as a student or actually after they graduated. Uh, and then because of course we lived, uh, this was in a time when medical education was really in its infancy and people like Richard were not there to tell us how to assess students, 10 failed just through bad luck. Uh, and obviously uh, that's very unfortunate. If we look at those who left the profession, he said that 13 left or were expelled in disgrace. So these are the people who have poor professionalism. Uh, three were wisely removed by friends, and it's always good, of course, to, uh, to have friends. Uh, three became actors, in actual fact. Three became homeopaths, but actually they were no good at that either. Um, so um, they couldn't even do that. And because, of course, this is Bart's in the, uh, in the 19th century, too retired, too rich to need to work. Those were the days, um, um, got long gone now, I think. So my point about showing you some historical data um, is that actually this concern about professionalism is not new. It's been going on really for many, many uh, decades. Um, and um, so we are looking at something which has been with us for a long time. That doesn't mean to say it's, it's not important, but I think in the past that we didn't have the tools to deal with it, whereas that's not the same now. And um, I, when I was at medical school, we had exams on knowledge and skills and we were assessed in the workplace, but we really didn't have any assessment of professionalism at all. Uh, and I know people who got through who one thought that these people should not be doctors because they didn't seem to have those characteristics that we would all hold dear to be a good doctor. So let's look at the importance of professionalism. I mean, is, if it's been going on for such a long time, is it truly important? So, these I'm in this uh, in this slide. I'm going to show you the reasons I think the the, the that summarise why uh, assessing professionalism uh, is really really important. And the first thing is that most complaints, at least in the UK, against doctors are not because of uh, uh, competence, but because of conduct, because of the way in which they have interacted with patients or citizens or society. And of course, when students come uh, to the medical school, they don't come with the full uh, complement of professional behaviours, needing only to teach knowledge and skills. They come from a wide range of backgrounds. And actually, we need to help them develop the professional identity of becoming an excellent doctor. 
And of course, in the past, I think people used to think that professionalism was osmos. That is, if we stood next to, if I stood next to Richard for long enough, that actually he would be, uh, it, his professionalism, his high level of professionalism would osmose into me. Now, there is some level, of course, of influence from role models. But actually, sadly, the role models that we see and their behavior in the workplace and in the university is not always um, uh, as professional as we might as we might think. So if I give you an example, and I'll use a surgical example, and I feel empowered to use surgical examples because I'm married to a surgeon. So I know about uh, surgeons and surgical behavior. Uh, and uh, this is this does not relate to my husband. He's not like this at all. But if the professor of surgery uh, in his operating theater shouts at people, uses foul language, throws instruments and so forth, then medical students who may attend to that might think, well, this is the professor of surgery. He's very, uh, very well respected. He's very uh, eminent. Um, this must be behavior must be right. So actually, of course, they're getting a, the wrong message there from a, somebody who should be a good role model, but in fact isn't. So I'm afraid, sadly, professionalism does not osmose, uh, and that's why we really need to teach it. And then, of course, we need to assess it because students will think if professionalism is important, then they'll teach it. And if it's really important, then they'll assess it. So the development of professionalism is important, as I say, and the reason for this and why we need to take it seriously in medical school is because present behavior, the behavior that we see in our students can predict future actions. And I'll come back to this in a minute with some data. Now, this is, I don't want you to go away and take the, away the uh, impression that, uh, uh, that I am saintly in my behavior. I'm not. Like all doctors, like many uh, of my colleagues, I am vulnerable to lapses in professionalism. You know, if I have a busy uh, clinic, uh, did I always take as much care uh, to be as professional as I should have done? Perhaps not. I'm not proud of that. I don't think it's right. And I think I would need to reflect on that and to look at how I would uh, avoid that sort of behavior in the future. Um, but I think, and I obviously would need, uh, would benefit from feedback from colleagues or from patients. And that's what happens now in, in appraisal. But it doesn't mean to say that I'm a bad and evil person. It doesn't mean to say that I can't change. And we also know that professionalism is associated with improved patient outcomes and patient satisfaction. And so this is not just something that we would like to have, that's something it's nice to have when things are going well and we're not stressed and busy. This is something that really affects patient outcomes and it's really so central and a core uh, to, uh, to the profession's DNA, if you like. Now, let me just show you some of uh, this data, which is a little bit old now, but it's taken from the GMC's fitness to practice in 2014. So in that year, there were just under a quarter of a million uh, doctors in practice. And you can see here, they, let me just go back a moment. Sorry, it's moving along quite fast. Um, there were uh, nearly uh, 10,000 complaints and some were not for the GMC, some went to the employer. But let's look at what happened to the ones that the GMC did investigate. And that's here. And you can see there's a range of things, conditions, warnings, no action, advice. But 22 uh, doctors were erased or suspended from the medical uh, register. And although, as you can see, that this is uh, a really uh, sh small number, uh, in actual fact, they do a huge amount of damage to the reputation of the profession because they are the people that uh, appear in the news, that appear in the, uh, on TV or in papers uh, or on blogs and tweets uh, and so forth. And these are the people that actually influence the trust that individual uh, patients and carers have in doctors or the or the fact or, or the trust that citizens and society have in the medical profession. So although, as you can see, there are a very small number of, uh, of doctors who really are um, very unprofessional, they have a disproportionate effect on the way that society uh, views the medical profession. And that's very, very unfortunate. 
Now let's look at the evidence. And most of this evidence uh, originally came from the States, uh, from colleagues such as uh, Maxine Papadakis. And she, in a paper that she first published in 2004, a study that she first studied, uh, as I say, in 2004, which was really a seminal study, I would say, what she did was she looked at those doctors who were appearing before the state licensing boards because of uh, misdemeanors, uh, unprofessional behavior. And then she tracked back to look at the, those uh, doctors and looked at how they had behaved when they were in medical school. And what she found was that there was a very strong association with unprofessional behavior in medical school and disciplinary action for unprofessional behavior in the postgraduate arena. So that was the first time that we uh, really had that actually, uh, I think, understood that. Probably in the past, I think that uh, certainly in the UK, our idea was, well, they're doing well in their knowledge and skills. They may not be as professional as we'd hope. Their behaviour is sometimes questionable, but just get them through, get them to graduate and they'll be much, uh, they'll be much better. They'll mature and become good doctors. But as you can see, that actually uh, was a misunderstanding uh, and we were not doing our students any favours by letting them go through without tackling this behavioural problems. And we were certainly were not doing anything uh, for our, our patients and for the, the reputation of the uh, profession. Now, the interesting thing was that in a further paper in 2005 that, she's, uh, that she found was the types of, uh, un, of unprofessional behaviour were strongly linked uh, to levels of irresponsibility and a lack of insight. And I think the crucial thing in this, uh, in this bullet point is a uh, lack of insight. And we've all, as I said, we can all make uh, mistakes. We can all have lapses in our professional behavior, but the vast majority of us feel bad about this and we, we reflect on it and we want to change and to look at how we might make sure that this doesn't happen again. But there are some individuals who actually have no inkling that their behavior has been, uh, has been so bad uh, and uh, that uh, this is not professional. So Maxime uh, and colleagues uh, did further work and she, what she looked at, um, for, and this surprised me, I suppose, were that performance measures in different parts of uh, assessment. So, uh, for example, assessment of knowledge or clinical skills independently predicted uh, this and were related to unprofessional behavior as a medical student and then disciplinary action later on. And actually, uh, in America, they had the residence annual evaluation summary. Um, and a low professional relation, uh, professionalism rating in this uh, evaluation was a very good predictor for people who went on to have problems later on, which really does validate uh, that annual evaluation. So, and as I say, poor uh, performance in cognitive tests also predicted uh, uh, poor professionalism uh, behavior and poor performance in uh, uh, national exams such as ABIM exams. Now I was surprised at that because I've always thought that there were some very bright students who actually got through because they were so bright but had this poor professional behavior. But Maxine's work actually uh, made me think again about that. So, in the UK, we had Tomorrow's Doctors, which first came out, I think, 2000, and uh, it was about 1995, first of all. But in a later version, um, the GMC started to think about um, professionalism in students. And this was very helpful because this was the first time that we were required not only to assess the knowledge uh, and skills of uh, students, but also required to assess their behaviors as well. And this is what it said in that original um, document. It said the overall curriculum must set out the, knowledge, the necessary knowledge, skills and behaviors students must have by the time they graduate. It also said that students' knowledge, skills and professional behavior must be assessed. So again, this was the first time that uh, it said uh, we must assess are, uh, are the behavior of uh, the students. And then it says only those students who are fit to practice as doctors should be allowed to uh, complete the curriculum. And those who those students who do not um, uh, 
do not demonstrate appropriate knowledge, skills and behaviour must be advised to follow alternative careers. I've often wondered what that alternative uh, career might be. Um, maybe these days, maybe a politician, uh, maybe a secondhand car salesman. I don't know. I'm probably being a little bit unkind. Um, this was then superseded by outcomes for graduates, but it's still actually from the GMC, it still requires us to assess uh, behaviours. And these documents are actually on the GMC's website, and I think they're very useful. And if you would like to download them, they're free, uh, certainly free to download. Um, as well as uh, outcomes for graduates, the GMC has uh, published um, another document, um, which is professional behavior and fitness to practice for medical students. And this is again, very, very useful. And it's something that we uh, make sure that all uh, medical students, when they come into, um, into the medical school, get a copy of or are aware of. And again, it's reiterated when they uh, enter a year which has much more uh, clinical um, uh, content and that they're on the wards much more than uh, previously. So, we need to, my message from this bit is we need to consider professional behavior early, right from the start of, of medical school. And a lot of people say, well, you can't really assess professionalism before they become professionalized. Well, I'm not certain that that's true. And it's something that we may uh, discuss in our later, uh, in our later Q and A's. So that's really the importance of professionalism. And now I'm just going to touch on the views of professionalism. And I'm going to get you to do some work, uh, first of all. Um, I'm going to ask you to think of the most professional person or people that you've ever worked with, and to think what were the characteristics of that individual, and then ask you to post your answers um, uh, either onto that website there, uh, Answer Garden, as you can see. And if you put that into your browser, you'll see uh, it should come up, or to use the uh, QR code and to scan that with your smart device, your phone. And the question is, what is professionalism in healthcare professions? So think about, as I say, think about the most professional person that you've ever known or that you work with uh, and what were their characteristics? And uh, let's let you do that for a moment and then I'll go to that website uh, and so we can uh, see what, you, what uh, you found. Now, Osman has written in the, the Q&A uh, to ensure we have a safe practitioner, commitment to rules, safety and best practice according to agreed criteria. And I think that's absolutely, um, absolutely right, Osman. Um, but I think uh, that actually that that needs to um, we need to think through um, what that actually uh, means uh, and actually to put um, to put down um, to students. Uh, and discuss with them what the answer to that would look like. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing this screen now and to go to um, a different screen to see where we've got some answers to this. So here are um, the uh, answers that people have been putting in. As you can see, um, a lot of things here in and the um, the the bigger you probably know about these wordles and the bigger the typing uh, and the font of the uh, of the word are uh, then the more people who have put in uh, what this means and so you can see here that that's integrity uh, honesty ethics empathy uh, competence self-awareness uh, reflective uh, respectable are really really important uh, and as uh, if you would like to continue to put, uh, to add things to this, then it will it, it, they will be shown up there, and uh, we can use this later on, um, it, possibly in the Q and A. So really important and interesting things there. Interesting, uh, impartial, a bit altruistic, altruistic. Other people have put on thorough and fair. A lot of things I think many of us would uh, would recognise. And I'm going to uh, stop sharing that and just ask Richard, are there any questions that we need to answer at this point, Richard? Um, I think there's some been some really great engagement in the chat, Trudy. So thank you to everybody who's typed away. I think just a few of the bits and pieces that have popped out about eagerness to learn. I really like that as a sign of professionalism. Uh, uh, lots of people talking about honesty um, and also um, problem solving. Um, I think there's some really, really good appearance as well i've just seen somebody appear there appear there i think there's some brilliant brilliant suggestions i think there's some really interesting comments coming out about when can we detect unprofessionalism that we're going to 
talk about in the second half, but also this sense, which I think we're going to talk about towards the end, aren't we, Trudy, about remediation. Is it just a matter of exiting people to another career, second-hand car salesman or um, you, or politician somewhere, as you say, I'd share those views, um, or, um, or in fact, can we, can we teach and improve and remediate? I think there were some brilliant questions there, but I think um, we could probably, probably keep going for now. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. So let's continue on here. And this, I'll just show you now some of the uh, wordles that we've got uh, when, when I've, uh, pre we presented this before, what we've got um, pe people have put in there. As you can see, ethics has come up again, uh, compassion, honesty, very prominently there. And a lot of people actually felt the patient and the patient should be uh, at the center of everything that we do. Um, so not that dissimilar from what we've been finding uh, here today. So now there are lots and lots of definitions of professionalism uh, if you go into the literature uh, and I'm going to share with you uh, one of them. I need to declare a, 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 an interest here. Um, this was done some years ago now by the, uh, this project was done by the Royal College of Physicians and they published uh, the document you can see there uh, on your screen called Doctors in Society. And I think this is still available on uh, the uh, RCP L London website, although they have updated it uh, in that time. But I, I'm showing you this because I really like the, uh, the definition. Uh, I took part in the, um, in the group of doctors who were uh, instrumental in pulling this together. And it was a really interesting project. And I can recommend it for any of you who want to do this in your own countries, which is we got together lots of people from different professions to ask them about what, what professionalism meant for them. So we got together lawyers, accountants, um, we got together um, solicitors and health, other healthcare professions such as nurses uh, and therapists and so forth and asked them what professionalism meant for them in their own discipline. And it was really interesting to hear uh, what they thought. We even got some, I think some engineers as well. And it was interesting how everybody had their own thoughts about what professionalism meant in their own discipline. And we also asked um, a sample of about 2000 postgraduate trainees in the UK, whether they thought professionalism was still relevant, whether they felt that actually now uh, it didn't matter and that actually they were just uh, a worker like anybody else. Um, and I thought that that was really very interesting because these were young people. And although for me, professionalism is, is really absolutely fundamental to being a doctor, obviously times change and we need to recognize um, that uh, a different world exists now than when I was a, a student and a junior doctor. But in those 2000, overwhelmingly, people felt that professionalism was important and very crucial to the way that doctors worked. And um, this was the, uh, was the uh, definition that we came up with. And I'm very grateful to um, colleagues who helped craft this. Um, so uh, it says medical professionalism sig signifies a set of values behaviours and relationships that underpins the trust the public has in doctors. And I think the crucial word there is trust. And I think this is really why that professionalism is important in medicine. It's all about trust. And it's every year there's a Mori poll done in the UK to look at which group of people that uh, society and citizens uh, trust uh, uh, mostly. Uh, and uh, it's very pleasing to see that doctors usually come out the top with judges number two. And then if you look right down at the bottom, there are things, people like politicians and, and, and so forth. So this is really crucial. Uh, and it's that's why it's the um, it's the definition that I like to use, but as I say, there are lots and lots of other definitions out there. There are lots of, uh, as I say, examples. Uh, the UK's uh, GMC has uh, definitions within duties of the doctor and good medical practice, which is the thing that binds all us uh, postgraduate uh, doctors together. 
Uh, can meds, they talk about uh, professionals, one of their uh, one of their elements and the ABIM and ACP and EFIM have a physician's charter, which talks about patient welfare, patient autonomy and social justice. And as I say, if you put into Google um, medical professionalism, you'll get uh, m uh, hundreds of thousands and even millions of sites. So I'm going to get you to do a little bit more work again and to think about what is your profession's definition of professionalism. To think about what your institution, this is the people that you work for, what is their definition of, in, of professionalism uh, and actually do those align? Because if they don't align, that's obviously very difficult. And to think of, are these universally applicable? And if, you're, if your institution or even your profession doesn't have a definition that you use yourself, then that would be interesting to know as well. So again, if you could write that in the chat and uh, Richard will be keeping an eye on that, that will be great. And I'll give you a few moments to look at that. So Asama saying participant and uh, participation and responsibility. Absolutely. Shiba, a con complex construct. It is, but we, we need to actually understand it so that we can do anything. I don't have a definition, says uh, Richard. <laughs> or if you don't have a definition, sorry, Richard, I thought you were saying that. Following orders. That's a very interesting one, Mariam. Following orders. What about if those orders are wrong? Ethical conduct, adhering to competencies for nurses. Thank you, Catherine. Adoption of patient-centered care, fantastic. Empathetic. And do professional as a family member. Yes, that as Richard knows, we have a um, an assessment in of uh, of the hospital trusts in the UK where we're looking at you know how likely are you to to recommend that your that your institution that a member of your family will be treated well in your institution and i think that's a very telling thing ability to treat everyone who you interact with with respect empathy absolutely empathy altruism fantastic altruism the patient comes first there's some very good uh, points to popping out truly in different places around um ethics and the relationship between professionalism and good healthcare ethics um, as well as evidence-based practice, which I thought was a really interesting link as well. Absolutely. I'll just say one thing about altruism, if I may, um, and uh, then Richard will stop me because otherwise I get into anecdote too much. Um, when we did that uh, work on doctors in society, um, there was a gentleman by the name of Harry Caton who was there, who was really, really very good. And he was what was known as the patient czar there. He was there to represent, if you like, patients' views, although that was, I always thought that was a very difficult job. And uh, he said um, that, um, in answer to a question, Professor Roberts, you know, patients these days don't need altruism. What they need is someone who is professional who will do a professional job for, the, for, for them uh, and altruism is probably a thing of the past and I was quite shocked about this because altruism is something that I really hold dear it's a sort of you know a, a real pillar of what I think about it and um, he said well if you had a, a doctor who was working in private practice in the UK who was doing um, plastic surgery and was doing say um, nose jobs or you know enhancement that they they don't the patients don't need someone who's altruistic but they need someone who's very professional and although I could take that and you know it's one of those things where you don't you know you think gosh maybe I'm wrong but but having thought about it and reflected on it since then I now have the uh, the answer to uh, to Harry um I don't suppose he's here but uh, but um uh, it, it, which is this is that yes most people in their day-to-day -day work don't need to show excessive altru altruism we don't we, we get on and do a good job however there are times and I would say that's been uh, very much so in the last two years of the COVID pandemic, where society expects uh, to doctors and other healthcare professionals to really step up to the plate, to really go above and beyond. Uh, uh, and I think that that's absolutely true. And, and certainly in the UK, we know that uh, society has been very grateful to not only doctors, but all healthcare workers who really actually put their lives on the line during this pandemic. So I would say altruism is still required there um, and as I say if I, when I meet Harry again maybe I'll talk to him about that. So we've done that that's really very good. Now this is just one thing which I want to bring to your attention because I think it's quite interesting. 
And that is, as you, there's some uh, work that started some years ago uh, by a girl called Alison Price in, uh, in Australia, and she looked at the, the different generations at work. And this, <clears throat> this work was done because of, um, she was asked to look at uh, by a, a number of uh, private companies, what they needed to do to, to recruit and retain really high quality workers. And she actually divided people up into different generations, if you like, and, and said that different generations did, needed different things. And this has been taken on since then. So as you can see, the different generations who are at work are, are put here. So the traditionalists pre-1945, fewer of those these days, of course. Uh, the boomers, uh, baby boomers, as we so call them, um, born between 1946 and 1945. 65, and I'm encapsulated in that, although I won't tell you at which end I am, but you can probably guess by the colour of my hair. Generation X there, who were born between 1966 and 77. Millennials born between 1978 and 1995. And Generation Z now, as they're known, or Generation 2020, who were born after 1995. And the reason I want to just show you this here, as you can see on that uh, uh, in that uh, slide, then the, the things that those people uh, of those different generations hold dear is written there in the grey boxes. Now, the reason that this is, I think, is important is because actually what's happening now is that millennials and Generation Z or Generation 2020 are being their professionalism, their professionalism is being assessed by baby boomers and Generation X. And if we hold different uh, ideas and different values uh, in the generations, then actually, um, then some students and some trainees who are being assessed may uh, be marked down on their professional behavior because people are using different value sets. So let me give you an example. <clears throat> In, uh, when I was a junior doctor, and I'm sure uh, when Richard was too, um, we worked very long hours. You know, 120 hours a week was not uncommon. I'm not defending it. I don't think it was right, but that's what we did. Um, and we never, you know, you didn't go off, uh, finish uh, your daily shift. Um, if there was other things to be done, you were expected to stay. Nowadays, the, work, the hours that uh, the doctors work are controlled, uh, and at the end of their shift, they are expected, and indeed previously were, were told to go. But you can imagine if I was assessing someone and they left in the middle of a ward round because it was running over or asked to go while they were assisting at a, a surgical procedure, that might colour my way of the way I look at them. On the other hand, of course, they may have different responsibilities now. They may have young children that they have to pick up from school or from a nursery or something, and they cannot stay because they don't have a partner um, who, can, who, who can take over from them. So it's a very different world for uh, our young people and trainees these days. And if we just hold to our old um, values that maybe should have changed, then we may be marking people down for unprofessional behavior. So within the professionalism, then I think that there are behaviors like integrity, like honesty, which, uh, which uh, are unchanged, but there are maybe also things like staying uh, endlessly, working endlessly long hours, which were not right in my day, and I don't think are right or to be expected now. So are there cultural or discipline effects? We've got, uh, Richard and I have got a very interesting uh, PhD student who's uh, from uh, uh, Indonesia, uh, and he's looking at um, professionalism in his country. And I do think that there are some, uh, some changes and it needs to be contextual. But there are lots of uh, there are lots of traits, as we've seen from what you've written, which actually um, are not only cross cultures, but actually, I think cross professions. So I think that professionalism in nurses, in physios, in OTs um, uh, is has probably the same basis um, as elsewhere. But there are, are maybe some cultural differences. But as it says here, there are a lot of shared values across health professions globally. So we're going to come on to Richard's part about assessing professionalism, the most important point, and I'm pleased that you've stayed with me and I'm very grateful for that. Um, and we're going to go into a break, but is there anything that we should cover be, uh, question wise before we stop, Richard? I, there were some, uh, again, thank you ever so much everybody for being such a generous audience with comments. It, it, it is like a, the proverbial tsunami here, and um, <laughs> that compares to 
uh, work I've done previously where it feels a little bit like the desert in terms of comments. So you, you have a great <laughs> audience. I think there are a couple of things I've, I've picked out. Um, one of which is just a comment because it, it relates quite well to what you've just spoken to this sense of geography and culture and history and how those things really influence that contextual understanding of professionalism. And I thought that was a, a brilliant point by, by Dr. Sheba. Um, Osman asked a, um, an interesting question, which is when we're teaching students about professionalism, should we teach it as a standalone course or should it be integrated with everything else? Well, that's a great question, Osman. And I think it really needs to be integrated with other things. It can't be something separate, something that we do, you know, on a wet Wednesday in Leeds when everything's going very well. It's something that we actually have to think about every day and with every patient and every interaction with colleagues. So I think it's about integration. And one of the things that Richard will remember that we did in an early part of the course, we got students who were going out into the clinical environment to bring in examples of what they thought were good uh, and professional behaviors and perhaps other uh, examples where they were concerned about professional behaviors. And those were actually discussed within their uh, tutorial groups uh, with, a, with a faculty member. Because sometimes um, you need to actually have some understanding about the context and so forth. So I think that we taught it in, in the classrooms, if you like, in, in tutorial groups, and then they went out to see, as it were, professionalism in action. And I think that that was really one of the most important things. And really, this I mean, they brought in some fantastic examples of great professional behavior, people going above and beyond, people actually having patients uh, and individual uh, individuals at the, the center of what they were doing and uh, made me very proud of our students uh, and our doctors actually. So I'd, I'd agree with Trudy there in that sense that yes it needs to be very integrated but you need to signpost this very very clearly quite early because um, integrated curricula have a lot to uh, to commend them but often key points can get submerged behind everything else so that sense of OK, before you start um, seeing patients and going out into clinical practice, let's really focus on this so it's just in your mind. Um, uh, the, the only other one I want to um, pop up, if that's OK, Trudy, to, before everybody has a quick break, is that a really interesting little side debate about whether uh, the, the challenge of uh, being in the public eye from a, prof uh, from a professional standards perspective and your own private life and conduct. And I was highlighting to... Um, to Camus in the chat, certainly in the UK, um, there is that sense that if your personal conduct outside of work is um, uh, uh, problematic, then that could actually have a big impact on your um, professional conduct. Um, and I, I think a lot of undergraduates often don't recognise that as they enter the profession. I think that's a really, really important point. And, and I think it's a point, a point that we need to, uh, a discussion we need to have with our students, <clears throat> because often they will say is, when I'm, when I'm off duty, when I'm not in a clinical environment, why can't I have a party? Why can't I perhaps drink a little bit more than is good for me, drive at a little bit of a faster pace, uh, do things that normal people do? Am I always on call? Am I always a doctor or a nurse or whatever? And I, I think, you know, it is difficult. Um, uh, and I think that these days people's views are different. But what I would say is this, if your behaviour actually means that it, uh, it impugns the trust that individuals, uh, patients have with doctor, their doctors, or that society has with the medical profession, then that's not good enough. I think it, this is the thing about trust. So I don't think we should all be saintly. I think you can go out and enjoy yourself afterwards, but all we, I think we have to remember that. And I think that's part of the responsibility. We we're very privileged in society. We have a huge amount of respect for being uh, a medical professional. Uh, and that comes with it, uh, with, with consequences, I'm afraid, uh, you know, and, uh, but other people may not agree with that. So that's quite an interesting, uh, you know, maybe I'm old fashioned. I am a baby boomer after all, so. There we go. Yeah, I've, I've got grey hair as well, but I sit in a different generation. <laughs> so I, I think before we go for a break, I'm just going to respond to a, a really, really thoughtful point by Dio Young, which is about professionalism also having the wisdom about know how to deal with the dilemma when there are no simple or direct right or wrong answers. And I think that's just such a beautiful way of encapsulating what everyday practice is to us. Um, 
and I can think about two or three cases this week in my own professional practice where, in fact, I was, I was explaining to one family where the evidence had stopped and the guidelines had stopped and how we as a profession or a group of professionals were trying to make decisions about what to do for a very, very complex patient case. You know, and I think that, that that's a really nice point to uh, to share with us, Dalia Yang. Thank you. Absolutely. I, I, I do think it's about, you know, you if there are guidelines, obviously one looks to those, but but too often there are we get to a point, as Richard says, where there aren't, and then we just do our best. We we but we talk to and involve the family and patients and we explain to them, I'm just going to do my best. And a number of you know patients will say, I'm sure to Richard as to me, is what would you do for your own mum? What would you do for your own member of your family? And and we we have to give help and advice based on what we know and our experience. So I think, uh, Richard, we were going to have a 10 minute break, if that's OK. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think that probably takes us to the top of the hour, whichever hour it is, wherever you are, just after uh, yeah. we come back then. And we're going to do the most important point. So please uh, join us, which is Richard's going to talk about uh, actually assessing professionalism. So thank you very much. See you back in 10 minutes. <clears throat> OK, I think we've got a couple of mi minutes, uh, Richard, for people to get back, if that's OK. I think that works for me. So I've, I've just stopped um, screen sharing for a moment and then. Uh... I, I wanted to get into the mood of being actually in Dubai, so I, I bought myself some dates and I to try and get in the mood of being there where because <laughs> we were meant to be. Yes. In Dubai, and sadly, now I'm in my own. Uh, well, I'm in my daughter's bedroom, so. Yes, I, I have some grapes and a cup of coffee. I'm, I'm not sure I've, I've quite made it as far as you have. I'm, I'm probably more um, Italian or Greek, I would say. I've got halfway there. <laughs> oh, Mariam said she didn't move. <laughs> uh, can I say, Mariam, that's not particularly good for joints or circulation. Um, so, um, you know, uh, get up and stretch. Nobody can see you doing this at the moment. So. <laughs> Um, make sure you uh, you leave move 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 one muscle. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, you are a great group. This is really fantastic. I mean, I have to say, Richard and I have done these things before, and often it's um it is it's not that fun because people don't engage, but you've been a great group it's funny does blinking the eye count richard that's what marion said oh absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, for somebody who does a lot of neuro rehab marion this is it's good communication is eye blinking <laughs> you've just got to make sure you wink at the right person in the right direction there yeah <laughs> great right I'm... okay shall we kick off again then richard over to you and i'll, man yes, I'll, the... I'll share my screen and truly will man the chat because i, I can't will. see see you guys typing so um Trudy will stop me um again there are a couple of talking points and shout out sessions where um we'd really value you getting involved right so i think the 10 minute break is over um so let's move on so um as Trudy's Trudy's done a brilliant session for us in terms of really setting out the context of why this matters um, and the importance of thinking about professionalism from a learning, a teaching, an assessing, and as many of you have highlighted, a remediation and improvement perspective. Um, and for many, many years, certainly for me, there was this sense that professionalism assessment was all about detecting people who were doing things badly. And it was all about me, and it was all my fault for being unprofessional. Um, and I'd like to share with you some really interesting work, and we'll, we'll, we'll point to some references perhaps at the end if we need, but uh, around work from Brian Hodges and colleagues in the Ottawa Consensus Statements uh, from 10 years ago and fairly recently refreshed. And what the group looked at is that sense of what am I assessing and who am I assessing? The individual, the team or the institution? And let's have a look at those uh, just now. Um, if I'm looking at the individual, what do I want to look at? That sense of attributes, of characteristics, of behaviours? Am I on time? How do I interface and engage with other people? What's my practice like with individual patients? 
Um, but what might I want to look at in relation to the team? Well, an important part of uh, uh, professionalism is not just who we are, but it's how we interact with others. And there's that sense of uh, obviously relationships, but also how I perform within a broader group or team. Um, and I think about my own practice, uh, whether that's academic or clinical, and I'm, I'm rarely working solely by myself. I'm usually part of a team, part of a meeting, part of a group of people looking after a patient. And in fact, assessing what goes on in that set of circumstances is hugely important. And as we know, and Trudy alluded to, and in fact, some, some of you mentioned in the chat quite nicely, the culture of an institution or an organisation can be really, really important. So what are the issues about the economy or the politics of the organisation? Um, often delivering care in quite challenging circumstances where um, there's less time, there's less resource, um, and where we're dealing with uncertainty, thinking about the last couple of years with COVID, can be really, really challenging. And they can affect us all in terms of teams and institutions. So what Hodges and her colleagues say is that we should ensure that our framework of professionalism assessment looks at all of those things. And they also challenge us to think about two things, this sense of an essentialist or positivist view. I am who I am. This is me. I'm fixed. I'm not going to change. I can't change. Versus this alternative, which I think for me is much more appealing, that uh, in fact many of our professional behaviours are constructivist. And they're actually uh, constructed and developed through those relationships as we start to um, make sense of what the organisational norm or the context is. Um, a little bit like Trudy's example of operating with a surgeon who behaves in a particular way. And I tend to um, put constructivist approaches very simply that you make me me. Um, working with you and in this uh, organisation helps form who I am and how I assess, uh, how I behave professionally. So how do we look at that from an assessment perspective? Let's think about the individual. Well, like lots of other things in medical education, it's all about the tool. Um, I must have more and more tools to uh, attack the learner and also faculty as well. Um, and you can possibly tell from my tone there that um, I'm, I'm increasingly um, despondent with the growth of tools rather than a sense of being really clear about what we're trying to do in terms of our purpose of assessment. So people have looked at this in great detail in terms of um, should we assess people before they enter medical school or nursing school or professional programmes? Well, um, professionalism develops. And in fact, there's not hugely amount of predictive value from those. Should we be assessing people whilst they're on the job? Um, that um, I increasingly is accepted as uh, a key part of what we do. Self-rating, well, again, some evidence about um, how useful that can be. But unless I'm really a reflective practitioner, I may just say I'm absolutely brilliant or I'm absolutely terrible. And I have limited insight, that very positive culture, into um, uh, my professional behaviours. So um, when we're rating, um, there's a huge growth, a huge industry of tools, and many of them sit within the literature about workplace assessment. And uh, sorry about the abbreviations there, but that seems to be medical education, doesn't it? Everything's three or four letters, but PMEX, the Professionalism Mini CEX, Multi-Source Feedback, MSF, PAT, Peer Assessment, um, critical incident reports, there's in fact a whole industry uh, of those kind of tools where we're assessing doctors and other health professionals. But an interesting thing that you may not uh, encounter in your own practice is patient uh, surveys and patient assessment. Um, and uh, I think that's that has an important geographical context, but certainly in the UK there's a real sense of for senior trainees and for senior practicing doctors like myself, I have to go through a, a, a three or four yearly process of actually gathering feedback from what patients see about me and what they think about me. And for me, um, the patient feedback is often one of the hugest um, uh, motivators in terms of reflecting on what I do and where I go. So what about the individual? Well, um, the challenge about individual professionalism that is predicated on some of those assumptions about this issue about the stability of traits and attitudes. I am who I am, rather than I think increasingly what good psychological evidence actually suggests is that things like belief systems, coping strategies, 
uh, the work of uh, Carol Dweck and others about the sense of mindsets uh, actually paint a picture that's actually much more agile and dynamic. So um, I may get two or three indicators of poor professional behaviour. Are they contextual? Are they a lapse? But to what extent are they predicted that I will always be professional? And I think the evidence points towards the fact that they're not. Um, as Trudy's highlighted before, we've got to remember that professionalism is learned behaviour throughout a curriculum. And when I use the word curriculum here, I'm not just thinking about undergraduate or bits of postgraduate training. It is almost through our professional lifestyle, a lifetime, should say, like rather than lifestyles. Um, one of the other criticisms of just purely looking at individual professional assessments is this sense of binary. Um, I am unprofessional. I'm not professional. Uh, and for me, often a lack of positive phrasing around positive professionalism. So if we just look at the behaviour of the individual only, we forget about the context, which many of you have raised, and it doesn't really help me think about how do I change and where do I go next. So from individuals to teams, let's think about this sense of interpersonal uh, professionalism assessment, where we're looking not just at the individual, but the team that they're working with and the environment that they're in. Um, and having moved academic jobs over the last few months, I really embrace some of the challenges here because as I'm starting to work and I'm learning about a new organisation, I'm particularly working with a new set of teams, um, that's quite challenging in terms of uh, managing behaviour and understanding and negotiating rules. So what we're looking at here in terms of interpersonal is trying to understand what's going on within the learning or clinical practice environment and also about the people too. So there is that sense, not just of multi-source feedback or 360 feedback on the individual. Let's try and understand what's going on within that team. So we might look at patient or customer feedback. We might look at group behaviors and group outputs, um, or even the potential for site visits and observed practice to see how the team work. So is it me that's the problem in relation to professionalism? Or might there be issues about how the team's working together? And as Trudy highlighted, the work of Shipper Ginsburg has been uh, really quite influential in terms of understanding the sense of situational or contextually specific professional lapses. So am I unprofessional all the time or is it a reflection perhaps when I'm stressed, I'm tired, I'm at the end of the shift, my clinic's overrunning? So I can understand, I can't excuse those behaviours, but I can start to understand more how the environment has shaped them. And the real value that Hodges and others have demonstrated is, like all good assessment, the important thing is about developing actionable feedback from this. So I know how I can change or the team can change. Um, as you guys have pointed out quite nicely in the chat, this sense of specific remediation for people who are demonstrating uh, poor professional behaviours is important. But in this sense, we're looking at, is it me? Is it you? Or in fact, do we need to look at remediation at a team level? And finally, the third level that Hodges talks about is this sense of actually looking at the organisation and the institution. And this very much draws on the complexities that create our institutions and how they function about history and geography. As Trudy was saying, our PhD, one of our PhD students has done this fascinating work, actually seeing how um, professionalism, is, professionalism is very constructed both through language, but also the historical cultures through which um, medicine has evolved um, and really helps determine um, some of how people behave and the expectations that patients and other colleagues place upon them. And when we're assessing in this situation, we're perhaps looking at what I'm going to call macro outcomes. So it's not about whether you or I are unprofessional or the outcomes of a multi-source feedback or a professionalism mini CEX. It's what is the culture of the organisation? And I point to things like healthcare safety, risk and error management. As we would say in the, uh, the UK NHS, is this a fit and proper organisation? So I'm actually looking at the attitudes towards improving care. One of the big challenges about professionalism, and I think one of the one of the rather shocking periods we went through in the UK was in some healthcare organisations, uh, the, the macro outcomes actually pointed to 
unprofessional behaviours and values right at the top of the organisation um, in relation to some pretty dismal practice about uh, patients being denied good care on a fairly routine basis. And we can look at that both through internal reporting within organisations, but external reviews too. Um, and the important thing there is it can help support remediation at the level of either the institution, and we've seen some uh, necessary but good turnarounds in the UK, but also that sense of who are we as a profession um, and are our values and behaviours appropriate for this current age? And for me, that points quite nicely to the great work that the College of Physicians and other people have done uh, over time, but also a big debate that's ongoing in the UK uh, about professional values around end of life care. So there's that real sense of a framework that's necessary here in terms of being able to assess at multiple levels before I can perhaps gain a, an individual view about somebody. So how do we put all that together? How do we make it work in an effective way? Well, um, like any good assessment, professionalism needs to sit as a key part of assessment right from the outset of the programme not something that goes on, as Trudy says, on a wet Wednesday um, and is completely over-dominated by knowledge tests and OSCEs. It needs to sit as part of that framework. We need to be clear about the purpose of our assessment and the consequences. And I think one thing we talk about less often than we should do are about positive professional behaviours and how are we highlighting those and how are we rewarding and celebrating what our students and faculty do really well. Um, What's very important for professionalism that's slightly different from other domains is that sense of repeating um, assessment throughout the lifetime of the learner. So that longitudinal set of practices, because saying I'm professional, I'm unprofessional in year one and then ignoring it um, is dangerous when that student may well be unprofessional in year two and three. We need to capture that information longitudinally. As we've highlighted, a range of tools. So it's not just one tool, not a focus on the knowledge test or the OSCE. We need to think quite cleverly about how we sample information about the individual, the team, uh, their assessors and the organisation. And like all good assessment, this is about development. How do I learn from what has not gone necessarily well? How do we build uh, both trust for the learners in our assessment processes, but also where there have been issues of unprofessional practice, um, how society and the rest of the profession trust us in terms of how we've uh, uh, acted and remediated some of those issues. So I'm going to start with some practical advice and the practical advice is not about learners. They come next. But to remind us that as assessors, actually assessing is quite challenging alongside the rest of our uh, working lives, but also particularly assessing professionalism is much more tricky than the standardised, highly structured world um, of the OSCE. So importantly, with any placement or rotation, uh, residency, what we want to be looking at is multiple sampling. So perhaps uh, not just with one assessor, but multiple assessors coming together to give a more holistic view. And I wonder um, uh, if you might think about popping some thoughts in the chat to say, well, what, what should be the focus for assessor training here? Should it be all about standardising behaviour and eliminating bias? Or should it be about accepting bias um, and thinking about how we deal with that in relation to feedback? So we'd be really interested in uh, some shouts out, shout outs around that. The big focus too for professionalism really reflects where I think broader assessment is going, that we're really interested here about narratives and not scores. Because particularly in professionalism, to say, well, Trudy's is seven and I'm a five, well, that's completely meaningless. It gives me no sense of whether that's good or bad. It gives me no sense about where I need to go. And it gives me no sense about um, how I get there. So in, in, increasingly, narratives and dialogues are really important to be able to guide people towards where they need to go next from development perspective. And whilst the tools are all very important, it's essential to have a system where we might want to raise concerns about our learners, sometimes because their behaviours have been unprofessional and we're worried about what that could mean, where there might be a patient safety issue, or where there may be issues about the well-being of our students and trainees, and we need to flag those concerns for their own support. 
So it's important that that system's in place. How about our learners? Well, again, a similar set of messages. Um, often when learners come into med medical schools or nursing schools or uh, similar, um, they've only been used to the sense that testing has been at large scale, high school exams, or in the early years, um, the, the single best answer knowledge test or the OSCE. So it's actually understanding that what we're doing here is different and they need to understand both the purpose of professionalism assessment, but the fact that it is going to be longitudinal and that we're assessing not just um, uh, competence, but we're also looking at development and feedback. And they themselves too need to understand how they raise concerns, either flagging their need for support themselves, um, and I've been privileged to work with some brilliant learners at all stages of their careers, where they've come to say, well, I, I'm not sure things are going well. Um, I'm not sure how I'm performing in practice. Um, and the issues have been about behaviours and conduct. And they've had insight to be able to reach out for help, to be able to report concerns and worries about their colleagues and peers in practice, but also about assessors and clinical practice concerns. And as Trudy was highlighting, one thing we did together in Leeds was uh, almost a traffic-like system of red, amber and green cards. And the green cards were both for faculty and learners celebrating brilliant practice. And the amber and red cards were to raise concerns. And this was as much about flagging not just concerns with individuals, but highlighting where, where um, clinical practice was less than desirable. Um, and often our, um, our NHS organisations who took uh, students um, really valued that feedback. It was almost that the students were acting as a professional lens themselves. So it's very important that we support learners to do that, but also to do that safely. So what we're going to put, I'm going to pause for a second, uh, both to see if there are any questions that Trudy might want to flag, but also to say that in the next slide, we're going to think about in your own contexts, which tools that you use for assessment might be useful for um, review, uh, for assessing professionalism. So Trudy, any uh, points that we need to stop and chat about? There's been some great comments. I have to say this, this group are fantastic. Um, and so a great comment, which was, what weight does the professor's assessment of professionalism have in? Have in? So I thought you might like to answer that one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, very little, I would say, these days, to be honest. I, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's not just about one person's view, because that therein lies a challenge. Much better to be able to say, this is what the professor thinks, this is what the attending physician thinks, this is what the ward manager thinks, this is what the physio and the pharmacist think, and triangulate that together. Um, and that's quite a challenge, isn't it, for traditional cultures where the professor's the top of the tree. I'm guessing Absolutely. I'm used to being the professor at the bottom of the tree. <laughs> Absolutely. But of course, often the professor may not have had as much um, uh, interaction with the student or trainee as the, the administrator or the, the cleaning lady or the junior nurse. And those people's uh, comments are really, really important, I think, Richard. I, I, I would agree, because often there's, what the evidence says is that to be able to guide change, I need to be able to see how others perceive me in practice but also that sense of um, almost trusting those individuals. Because if it's somebody, you know, um, I'm, I'm on Professor Roberts' placement and uh, Professor Roberts saw me for, for four minutes three weeks ago and she's making a view about my professionalism. Well, guess what? I probably will disregard that observation from Professor Roberts. That might be right or, you know, she may have something brilliant to say, but you don't know me, you don't work with me. Um, and we know that particularly in relation to accepting uh, assessment uh, uh, outcomes and particularly feedback, it's all about that trust in the person that you work with. Um, Maruna, um, Maroon, sorry, uh, says, is, do we think that uh, there's a decreasing level of professionalism in time? And if so, why? Well, I, I think there's some really interesting work there. And you've talked about this before, Trudy, about where... Um, things like empathy and compassion start to deteriorate as people move through medical school uh, and particularly we were talking about this with some international colleagues at the start of the week uh, as doctors in particular and I would say this applies to most health professions as they move through the world of work and um, compassion and empathy can sometimes be challenged a little bit by the environments that they work in 
Um, and I think they, for me, they're less about the, the, they're less about the individual, but more about the, the cultures that they, they work in or they're assessed with. I've got to jump through these hurdles. I've got to get this done. Um, you know, somebody's overbooked my clinic again. I've got to be in three places at once. And you can see that impact on, uh, on people's emotion and energy in terms of, um, you know, how well they work with professionals and uh, patients. And then finally, uh, there's a, a question, I think it's from Osman, about uh, in the undergraduate setting, should, should assessment of, uh, of uh, professionalism be only formative? Um, yeah. um, or should, it be, there should, be, should there be some summative assessment? I think Osman is, um, as ever, a finger on the pulse, as they would say, because we're going to look at this um, exactly in the next slide, which is that sense of um, it's not just about learning. We need to have uh, that sense of confidence that as our learners progress through all stages, that we know we've got enough data to be able to say, well, OK, I've seen you in lots and lots of different areas of practice at lots of different times and you're OK. So let's what we're going to do next is I'm going to put up two taxonomies, very, very simplified, the much loved, uh, but I would say often abused Miller's Pyramid. Um, I'm afraid to say it's a vertical column now because my slide, my slide skills are not uh, not good enough. Uh, and I've used a combination of uh, different taxonomy, which is Bloom or Mazzano. What I want you to do is at each level, and I'm going to leave, I'm going to pause so people can throw some answers out in chat and truly can feed them back. Um, what tools might we use? So hopefully I can get this going again. So if we look at the bottom, so for Miller, this would be nose or nose how or blooms about retrieval and application. If we're thinking about professionalism, which tools do you have that might work here where we can actually we can assess professionalism at this level? So we're looking at the nose and nose how or the applies. What do people think? Just give it a moment and then if not, I shall reveal the answers. In, um... <laughs> so there's things coming up like group discussion, uh, ooh, no, self reflection, uh, well written scenarios, OSCEs, simulation role play, MTQs, says Mariam, team based learning. So, okay, absolutely, um, I, I'm, I'm loving this. So I'm just going to uh, reveal. So I think this is what people might talk about. Well, it's, it's almost testing what the defining issues are. And you're right, these higher level things around, for example, uh, the OSCE or workplace assessment will absorb elements of this. So I'm, I'm expected to bring this into this wider level of assessment, but even at a very junior level, early for early learners in the curriculum, we can look at my understanding of professional values, uh, frameworks uh, of legal and ethical conduct. So things like the, the good old fashioned single best answer or the MCQ um, group discussions. I really, really like that. We get a lot out of people when we're, we allow them to, to talk freely, as well as the, uh, the joy of the essay. So what do people think about the shows level? Good old Miller shows, or as Bloom might say, the analyze and evaluate. So which tools we might, might we look at professionalism for showing? People are looking at OSCE stations, simulated pay, uh, patients, simulation. Gosh, they're coming through faster than I can look at video analysis, group cushion, discussions, role plays. Yeah, yep. direct observation, virtual I, patients. I think this is this is lovely. You you Loads really of really really uh, creative. It would have been it, one of the one of the regrets at the moment. I think for Trudy and I is it would have been so much fun to actually see the energy in a room. Although <laughs> absolutely with, 100, with 178 of you, I think that might be um, uh, might might be a different challenge. So what does what does the the literature and the evidence say? Well, this is at the shows level. It is very much that sense of simulated practice assessment. So the OSCE absolutely in there and um, simulated um, activities in clinical skills labs, but often that sense of let's pose somebody with an ethical dilemma or a debate where they might be challenged by a, a colleague or a scenario to think about um, what are the key issues here. Um, and the very the nice thing the literature reminds us here is that when we're thinking about this, it's not just what the assessor thinks, so the traditional OSCE, but it's bringing in patient and peer views. 
they're really, really important. So let's move a little bit further up the, um, uh, the Pyramid of Truth. And um, here we are. This is the top of Miller, but you'll see I've got one level above. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But at the top of Miller, we've got does. Well, what Mazzano or Bloom would talk about, produce or solve. And this is very much higher level forms of practice and assessment. So which tools could we use here, do you think, um, to assess professionalism in the does scenario? So that might be the everyday world of work, whether you're a doctor, dentist, teacher, engineer. So I think with Thuraya, who we know, Richard, so yeah. she's uh, talking about, um, you know, workplace based assessments, direct observation in the workplace. Lots of people talk about direct observation in the workplace, MSF. Yeah. Um, absolutely with you on all of those. Yes, I can see my my my. I've got a little chat icon above my <laughs> screen here, which is just it, it, it's go, it's sort of going up and up and up. Yes, exactly. Brilliant. So, what do we say about tools here? Well, I think two things. There's this sense of um, observed encounters of the individual clinician, whether that's a student or a postgraduate practitioner. Um, workplace assessment, as we've talked about, mini CEX, multiple source feedback. But this is the level where you want to be thinking about understanding group encounters and how group professionalism starts to work. So multiple team based assessment, how how uh, example, how a clinic or a ward deals with um, action planning from a, an incident, but also where you can gather here quite good patient feedback about this was my experience. And we don't have time to talk about this, but there's something called PROMS, P-R-O-M-S, Patient Reported Outcome Measures, uh, which we're seeing more and more in the literature. And in my academic unit, um, um, our, um, our um, professor of nursing really, really has pioneered this in terms of patients being able to give that feedback about their overall experience and encounters. So we're looking about the entire pathway um, whether that's a, a chemo or a radiotherapy or a surgery pathway. Brilliant. So the top, now this is something that traditionally Miller hasn't had, but there is this increasing sense that we should be looking at is, um, and certainly what uh, Mazzano and Bloom would call that sense of the metacognitive or the self. How do we assess the professionalism self? Yeah, and people are putting reflective writing, self-assessment, reflective journals. Um, yeah. What a brilliant group. Journaling, reflective work. Yeah. I, I think it's it's interesting because had we done this, had we put this box, this top box in five years ago, Trudy, we'd have probably had <laughs> it would be silence, empty. wouldn't we? <laughs> it would have been empty, but the great things here: self-reflection, case reports, peer discussion. Yeah, great. And um, it's almost like you read my slide, so thank you very much. <laughs> um, I couldn't come up with anything else, but there is that sense of it is about the responding to and the developing of self. Where do I go next? So I've got all this data about me and I've got all this actionable feedback, but what am I going to do? As Dylan William often says, that good feedback should be much more work for the person receiving the feedback than the person giving it. I accept it doesn't always feel like that when you're dealing with undergraduate students, but the focus here is when I've got this quite detailed feedback about myself, what's my action plan? And I reflect because this is what in the UK we would call we 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 have a revalidation or a relicensure process, and this has been my relicensure year, if or well, last year was, um, and a lot of that involved gathering quite a lot of detail about what people thought about me. <coughs> Excuse me, professionalism surveys, multi-source feedback, my um, my incident logs, and whatever else. But what my appraiser was interested in was, in fact, what was I going to do with this. And in fact, that was the most constructive part of the appraisal was just thinking about that sense of self uh, and how I developed further as a practitioner. So absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much, guys. So we're going to move on uh, again further. And you will have seen lots of things, but here are a couple of examples of forms. And the highlight for here for me is that how these forms have changed. So 10 years ago, these would have been full of numbers and tick boxes and whatever else. And what we're highlighting here is obviously there's a framework, there's some language about what the assessor should be um, capturing. So we, we, we've got that clarity of purpose. But the big thing for me is the comments box. Anything especially good. Um, so we're, we're not just saying, OK, not OK, concern. 
We've got to talk about what we saw, but I like this form particularly because this is about anything that's good, an opportunity to praise. Because as truly highlighted in the work from uh, General Medical Council Fitness to Practice, um, all over the world, we've got uh, brilliant doctors, nurses, dentists, and the vast majority of them aren't just doing an okay job, they're doing a brilliant job. And being able to highlight that with assessment is really, really important. It's nice to get nice comments. Um, here's a different format. This is a professional attitude and conduct form, which allows people to um, report an incident. And this is slightly different. So this would dial into Shipper Ginsburg's work around the professionalism lapse. And again, I'm slightly more structured here. So you can see there's a lot of text. It's not an assessor friendly form from my perspective, but it starts to highlight, in fact, where, where there was an issue. Can you try and quantify what the issue was? Um, and give us some sense of what went on um, and any actions that we might need to move forward. So you could see this being used, something used by faculty for learners, learners for learners, or potentially um, in a, a, a careful and safe way, learners reporting issues about faculty. So I highlighted before, your, the culture's got to be right for that, but we've had some good experience in the UK with such forms. So we've talked about learners, we've talked about assessors, we've talked about our tools, but we need to come back to organisations because their cultures matter so much. So what else do organisations need? Well, I think for me, there are these sense of four areas, but there needs to be that sense of a learning and development culture. And that needs to be very, very clear right from the top. So it's not that we pay lip service and tick box to this, we're not really that bothered about the learning and development culture, um, but uh, we, we actually actively demonstrate ourselves how we're part of that. That when we're looking at professionalism, the support that we need is not just for learners, but it's about faculty. That we need um, a sense of frameworks to ensure that we're dealing with that safely. So how do we debrief when issues happen? How do we report when there are concerns? We'll move on to that in a second. But importantly, there needs to be some sense of remediation and development when there are issues. And they're at the levels of learners, of faculty and curriculum. And as Trudy and I know, having done this in different, different guises in different areas, there needs to be some sense of regulatory processes and practices. So some form of formal fitness to practice or conduct or health and conduct type processes where we can investigate where there are bigger issues. So how can we put it all, put all of this together? Um, because we're trying to deal with almost what feels like 48 hours of a traditional workshop in just 90 minutes. So the key messages for us are this. It's about putting it all together as part of a holistic learning and assessment strategy. It's not just bolting professionalism on um, at the side. <laughs> it's about using the right tools sensibly and sampling often and actually bringing our learners and faculty with us on that. It's thinking increasingly in this modern age about how we can collect that data well. So lots of paper forms um, have a problem that they get lost or they get filed out somewhere and they never, they never see the light of day again. Whereas increasingly using technology to collect the data, but also to visualise it so I can see um, Trudy, or my, Trudy or mine's um, entire professionalism assessment portfolio is really, really helpful. And again, in my appraisal, all of this was set out for me. And that was really useful to be able to see what people thought and felt. And finally, it's not just about <coughs> collecting, saying we do professionalism tick. It's about that sense of making it matter. So how are we looking at um, supporting our learners and also developing them too? So the last few slides before we come on to a general chat is this sense of can we make change? It's all very well detecting uh, less than professional behaviours, but how can we change learners? Or can we change them at all? So what we know is that this sense of attitude and behaviour are very, very complex. They're not a linear relationship and they are not um, a very simple relationship that lots of other contexts will actually mediate that sense of how I feel and what I think versus how I behave. Uh, but we know that attitudes will actually drive that sense of behaviour, um, whether that's uh, around a whole range of different protected characteristics. 
However, the challenge about just measuring those attitudes, the general sense of attitude, it's not it's not predictive of a specific issue at a specific time. Unlike, I say, a highly reliable knowledge test where I can say, well, if I did that knowledge test again, I would get the same answer. That doesn't work quite as effectively for saying, well, if you behave like this in this circumstance, does that automatically predict that you will behave like that in the in a different circumstance? It doesn't. Um, so what we need to do is to actually um, sample and track over time. Now, the important thing is, can we change? Um, and the work, uh, the work before from Asgen and Fishbein very much looked at this sense of um, the theories around learned behaviours. So um, as I learn, I just settle into those behaviours. And we often said that as we reach middle age and beyond, those behaviours were very, very difficult to challenge and move on. But what we know is that if we're going to change behaviours, it requires you to really engage yourself with a fundamental belief change. And that's not just at the level of students, but it's the level of faculty as well. Um, as Maxine Papadakis uh, highlighted when Trudy and I met her uh, many, many years ago, for me, there was that sense that Maxine talked about the biggest challenge was not just um, students being unprofessional, but that sense of actually reporting and highlighting faculty unprofessionalism and how you really changed and developed that. But um, I, I think before, psychologically, there was that sense that we couldn't change. But there is increasing work that says actually when you use uh, approaches such as coaching, nudging from the behaviour change wheel, growth or activity mindsets, at all stages, you can change um, some of these behaviours uh, and underlying attitudes. But it takes time and it takes specialist support and it just doesn't happen overnight. So what does that mean for the future? Well, um, we're increasingly using technology to actually gather data and understand how learning and practice take place in healthcare. Um, and it's a, an interesting but potentially dystopian view that in fact, the machine might actually gather more details about us and say, well, Trudy Roberts, Richard Fuller, you have been unprofessional because I've gathered lots of data about you in practice. But what people are highlighting here is that in what we call human only traits and some of the work by Gerd Leonhardt, who's a technology futurist, has been really influential for me. He talks about the sense of the things that can't be automated becoming more and more valuable. And I think more and more people are highlighting the sense that, in fact, human traits are really important. So what does that mean for assessment? Well, it means that the biggest challenge will remain professionalism assessment. Um, things like performance and knowledge will still be important to do, but we'll get better and better at them, I hope. But in terms of who we are, how our values change, how societies change, professionalism will be really, really difficult uh, to, um, uh, to do well. And that, you know, as I think as a profession, we really need to put our energies behind doing this well. So I think that's where we're at to in relation to the end of the, the, the sort of spoken to slides. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a second so we can have that broader conversation. So thanks very much, Richard. Lots of questions um, I've been dealing with in the and comments in the in the chat. I realise that we're a little bit over time, so I'm sure Waleed will be looking at his watch and and shaking yeah. his finger at us in a minute. Sorry, so thank you very much. And I'm sorry for interrupting Professor Trudy. No, Professor no. Hadley wanted to speak. Trudy and hey. Richard. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Thank you very, very, very much for accepting our invitation and sharing with now. I think uh, we are over 2,000 participants in this wow. conference so from 35 countries. Wow. And I think in your session, there were approximately 200 in the workshop, which is a big number. <laughs> for, for a workshop <laughs> but i really appreciate uh, all what you did and i am very very sorry that we are not together here in uae but this was a situation sure a uh, few months back uh, i'm very pleased the situation is getting better now and there is an open invitation for 
to you to come anytime. You are our guests and we will definitely make sure that you will come and visit us here within the coming few months. So okay. Many, many thanks. Uh, uh, well, Judy and many thanks to Richard. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Hosam. It's been a fantastic uh, workshop, one of the best we've ever done, I think. And uh, I would like to thank Dr. Walid and Mr. Surai because they've been really great and they know how anxious I am with the technology. But but the participants have been absolutely fantastic. So engaged. It's been I, wonderful. I, wonderful. I, I, I cannot think, in all honesty, of doing an online uh, workshop with so many people where there's been so much engagement and so many brilliant observations. <laughs> uh, you know, I think uh, so many of the things that you guys have said have been um, really valuable. I think not just contributing to the session, but, you know, I think Trudy and I always say that when we run these sessions, this is as much for us about learning too, as well yeah. as sharing perspectives with you. And, you know, there, there are so many thoughtful little gems and nuggets that have come out that, have, that will make me go away and think, to be honest, about you know, uh, our own practices. So well done. Yeah, well done to them. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. So I think that's there's nothing more to say, really. We'll let you all go off now. Um, somebody was asking about the slides, but this has been recorded, Dr. Walid. So those recordings yeah. will be available, I think. Yes. Uh, completely uh, it is recorded and I think it will be posted on our website. Great. Okay. Well, I look forward to seeing you perhaps at a different time at a plenary tomorrow or some other time. It'll be great. Okay. Yes. Remember, keep, keep, moving. Much. keep moving. Keep don't, moving. Don't moving. Get, yes, keep moving. Moving those muscles. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Bye-bye.